I'm Meredith Gerfonti, Managing Director and Head of our Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Communications Practice at FTI Consulting. By way of brief background, I joined FTI Consulting in 2019 after having spent six years serving as a spokesperson and Senior Director of Public Relations in-house at Equifax. Many of you listening to this training might be familiar with Equifax when they made headlines around the world for their 2017 breach. I was on the front lines helping to manage crisis communications during that incident, which really propelled my career in cybersecurity and has afforded me the unique opportunity now as a consultant to have walked in the same shoes that many of my clients today find themselves in when facing their own cybersecurity challenges, either before, during, or after a cyber attack. Since joining FTI and helping to build the cybersecurity and data privacy communications practice, we've been focusing on three things. Number one, helping organizations of all shapes and sizes across industries and geographies assess how prepared they are to manage a breach, whether that be reviewing their incident response plans or crisis communications plans, revamping their crisis escalation protocols, or conducting lifelike simulations, mock breaches, or tabletop exercises. Number two, we're helping a lot of organizations who are actually going through a cyber breach respond to it and communicate consistently to all of their most important stakeholders, like their regulators, customers, employees, investors, or the media. And then third, we're working with organizations after a breach to help rebuild their reputation and restore trust with their key stakeholders. Now, the most interesting and I think important of these spaces is what we'll spend the majority of our time focusing on, which is incident response. Since joining FTI, I've worked on some of the responses to the world's most prominent cybersecurity incidents from major nation state attacks to breaches involving the theft of sensitive IP, DDoS or denial of service threats, large scale ransomware attacks, and many others. And the interesting and, and scary thing about cybersecurity is that no one company or organization is really immune, regardless of their industry, size, or geography. And that includes local, state, and federal governments and agencies. In fact, in recent months, we've seen a significant uptick in our client work with the public sector, including municipalities, public school systems, and hospitals. Now, just to throw out some stats, in 2020, around 2,300 U.S. governments, healthcare facilities, and schools were impacted by cyber incidents. That includes around 100 federal, state, and municipal governments and agencies, more than 500 healthcare facilities, and around 1,600 schools, colleges, and universities. The remote workforce environment driven by COVID-19 has as you can imagine, led to a pretty increased attack surface, making these entities with already strained resources even more prone to cyber attacks, and in particular, ransomware attacks. So what is ransomware anyways? Well, to put it simply, ransomware is a type of cyber attack that involves malware or malicious code that cyber criminals deploy in order to encrypt certain systems or components of its victim's network. It effectively locks users out of systems and makes them unable to access things like their email, sometimes billing or payroll systems, or other important things like file sharing applications. The criminals, or threat actors as we call them, then ask the victim to pay a ransom or monetary demand in order to get the key to decrypt or unlock the systems. Now these days, there's an added component to ransomware attacks. In addition to encrypting systems, the threat actors have gotten pretty savvy when it comes to getting their money. So as an added layer of extortion, they sometimes also steal sensitive data. Think personal information or financial information, company intellectual property, um, and they hold that hostage as well until they get payment. And if they don't get payment, the criminals threaten to make this data public or they try to sell it on the dark web. They've got some pretty nifty PR tactics up their sleeves and they try to publicize their efforts by 
doing things like writing press releases, contacting the media, or even taking out Facebook ads about their successful attacks, as we've seen in some cases. This is all an effort to turn up the heat and get the victimized organizations to pay. And you may be thinking, wow, this sounds crazy, like something out of a movie. Does this really happen? And the answer is yes. And unfortunately, it happens all too often. As you can see on the slide, here's a few real life examples of how these things have played out. So here you'll see some headlines around schools that have had to go offline and take their virtual learning down um, while they're rebuilding their networks after suffering a cyber incident. There's one really famous case that you likely have read about where a hospital in Germany was hit by a ransomware attack and they actually had to divert an ambulance to a, a hospital further away since their operations were disrupted, their emergency room was offline, and a woman actually died um, as a result of that ransomware attack. So these things can be really serious. There's a ton of other examples about, you know, entire cities that have had to shut down essential services like 911 and, and police departments being offline. Um, so these are really serious threats. You may also be wondering, am I at risk? Is my organization at risk? And I don't say this to scare you, but the answer is yes. Everyone is at risk and everyone should be prepared to counter this type of threat. In particular, organizations like local governments, schools, and hospitals that rely on connectivity and, and technology to serve their constituents, students, or patients are prime targets. Number one, because they need to get back up and running as soon as possible and can't deal with prolonged system outages um, or downtime. And number two, because oftentimes these organizations manage or store sensitive data like police records or academic records or medical records. Um, so these are some of the most likely entities to pay a ransom in order to minimize operational disruption and prevent the leakage of any sensitive data that they may hold in their systems. And the threat actors know it. But don't fret, there are a number of things that you and your teams can be doing to effectively prepare yourselves so that you're in the best position possible to respond to one of these kind of situations. So what do you need to be doing? Number one, don't be patient zero. <laughs> so from endpoint detection monitoring tools to training and awareness initiatives to firewall configuration, your IT and cyber teams are more than likely already doing everything they can to make sure your infrastructure is as safe and as sound as possible. But we all need to be vigilant and do our parts in helping them to defend against the adversaries. So be aware, be smart, be cautious, and be a team player. Be an asset to your cyber folks. Don't click on suspicious links or open attachments from unknown sources. Always trust but verify. No one wants to be the person, aka patient zero, who took down the network or major organization susceptible to a ransomware attack by clicking on a phishing link. And this happens all the time. So don't be patient zero. Number two, put your plan down on paper. So cyber crises are inherently different from the more common crises that your team may be used to dealing with or handling in your respective offices. They involve collaboration between cross-functional teams like IT, communications, operations, and external forensic advisors. And these teams aren't always used to dealing with each other, and they don't necessarily speak the same technical language. Um, there are certain decision points involving regulatory bodies, media outlets, and legal risks that need to be carefully weighed and decided on together by this cross-functional team. My advice here would be to not only have your incident response plan documented, but also to put your corresponding crisis communications plan down on paper. Outline rules and responsibilities, decide on your approval process for getting things like media statements or constituent communications out the door quickly and decide now on how you will escalate urgent needs to various members of the team. Don't spend a lot of time wordsmithing communications materials because those are gonna change. Every cyber matter is unique and the fact patterns will shift depending on your forensic investigation. But you should have communications needs and specific materials sketched out 
and know who's on point for dealing with them so that you can adjust or tailor them quickly to the situation you're dealing with. Number three, practice like you're gonna play. This is my final point, which is simply encouraging you um, to do your tabletop exercises, to conduct those lifelike simulations, drills that we talked about because they're so important. Putting yourself into a heat of the moment type of environment that's lifelike enough without actually being real allows your organization to practice their incident response plan and figure out now, instead of in the middle of a crisis, what, what's working well and where there are weaknesses. I cannot emphasize enough how critical being able to pinpoint any gaps in your plan and having the opportunity to address those will tee you up to be even more effective and seamless when you're in the middle of managing the real, real deal. These kind of exercises also give those different team members the opportunity to get used to working together and practice escalating and resolving problems as a team. We just wrapped up one of these drills for a Fortune 500 organization where we simulated a ransomware attack and the company had to make just paramount decisions around production disruptions, communication with its key clients about how would they would fulfill um, existing orders, updating the board of directors and other things that they just hadn't thought about. It was so lifelike to the point where we actually mimicked the threat actor's website and the posting of the company's data to it that everyone's heart rate was was cer certainly escalated and, and elevated, including my own. So um, to wrap up, I hope you found this session and my various war stories and, and pointers useful. If I can ever be helpful to you or to your organization, please don't hesitate to reach out. And again, just thank you to Google and the National Cybersecurity Center 